Welcome to worship with Grahamston United Church. Before we begin this act of worship, I have to announce the sad news of the death of Francis Crichton, formerly a member of St James's Church. She died on January the 29th, and her funeral will take place at Falkirk Crematorium this coming Wednesday, 17th of February. Please remember her sons, Robert and Jim, and their families in your prayers. So let us prepare ourselves to worship God. We hear words from Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Let us pray. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you look upon all that you have made, you do not remain indifferent to us but you show your love to those whom you have called to be your people. We come to you to praise your name and to give you thanks, to hear your word and to offer ourselves in your service. Send your Spirit upon us, we pray, so that this act of worship may be for us a time in which our faith is renewed, our hopes restored, and our love rekindled, that we may live with courage and joy the life that you give us. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the 58th paraphrase based on chapter 4 of the letter to the Hebrews, where high the heavenly temple stands.
prepare ourselves to come to God in prayer of confession, we read in the first letter of John, This is the message we have heard and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So in a moment of silence, let us confess to God our need of his forgiveness. Almighty God, we confess to you that so often we have failed to live in the light. We have been afraid that the light of your word might challenge our illusions about how good we are. We have been afraid that the light of your truth might challenge our most cherished assumptions. We have been afraid that if we came into the light of your presence and were honest about ourselves, others might come to know us as we really are and not as we want them to think we are. Almighty God, you know us. We cannot hide from you. Just as you know our highest and brightest hopes and joys, so too you know our deepest and darkest thoughts and fears. Yet in Jesus Christ you have come to us, announcing forgiveness and renewal, offering us new life, in the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we turn to you, trusting in your word of forgiving grace, and asking that your Spirit might enter into our hearts and minds and cast away all that is contrary to your will, that we might live only to your praise and glory. This we ask for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The first letter of John continues, My children, I am writing these things to you, so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. My friends, Almighty God, through his word to us in the Scriptures, has assured us that in his Son Jesus Christ we find complete forgiveness for our sins, and the invitation to live in the light of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. May we take to heart this word of forgiving and renewing grace and live to God's praise and glory, now and for ever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. When you go out to war against your enemies, and see horses and chariots, and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people, and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel! Today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. 
let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you victory. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, Is there any man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And is there any man who has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man enjoy its fruit. And is there any man who is betrothed and has not yet taken his wife to be? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in battle and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further to the people, and say, Is there any man here who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. And when the officers have finished speaking to the people, then commanders shall be appointed at the head of the people. Our second reading comes from the second letter of Paul to the Christians in Corinth, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ.
My friends, today is Transfiguration Sunday and so you might have expected to hear the story which tells of Jesus going up a mountain with Peter and James and John. On the mountain Jesus is glorified as the presence of God symbolised by a bright cloud covers the mountain. A voice is heard saying, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. We have not heard that story, but you can find it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, and read it at your leisure, if you wish. Today is also St. Valentine's Day. It's not often that February the 14th falls on a Sunday, and it is quite rare that St. Valentine's Day should fall on Transfiguration Sunday. Perhaps you know something of St. Valentine, or perhaps we need to say Valentine's plural, for there may well have been more than one man named Valentinus who became a Christian and was put to death because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Apparently the name Valentinus, which means valiant or brave, was quite popular among the Romans during the 3rd century AD. One story says a Christian named Valentinus was bishop in the city of Terni, north of Rome. The Roman emperors of the day were often fierce persecutors of the Christians, and during one such period of persecution this Valentinus was brought to Rome and was put to death because of his faith. But whilst he was in prison awaiting his execution, one of the judges came to him and asked him to help his daughter, who was blind. Valentinus not only cured the girl's blindness, says the story, but fell in love with her and married her secretly. Their wedded life didn't last long, as shortly afterwards he was put to death, but he left his bride a message of love, written on a piece of paper cut into the shape of a heart. Another story tells us about a priest named Valentinus who refused to obey a law brought in by the Emperor Claudius II during the middle years of the 3rd century. This Claudius is not to be confused with Claudius I, who was emperor in the middle of the first century. You may remember the book I, Claudius. The story goes that due to prolonged warfare, there was a mass call-up of young men into the army. A law was passed banning young men from marrying until they had served in the army. Valentinus, however, continued to perform marriages for young Christian men and women, believing that marriage was ordained by God, and that no human ruler had the right to stop two people who were in love from being together. The emperor summoned Valentinus, and after interviewing him, put him to death. So let us look at the passage from the book of Deuteronomy and how it connects to the story of St. Valentine. Our reading from the book of Deuteronomy proposes a remarkably different approach from that taken by the Roman emperors. Instead of banning young men from marrying until they had served in the army, the book of Deuteronomy exempts the newly married from military service. It may have come as something of a surprise to you to hear of army officers walking up and down the ranks, calling on those who had recently built a house, or planted a vineyard, or married, or for that matter anyone who was afraid, and inviting them to leave before the battle. Now, the reason given for offering an escape to those who were afraid is understandable. An army needs courage, and those who are afraid are likely to undermine confidence. 
But what of those others who are invited to return home and enjoy the pleasures of home whilst their comrades put their lives at risk in battle? How shall we understand this? The answer lies in the previous section of our reading. When the priests speak to the soldiers, assuring them that God is with them. Now, this could be understood as the usual God is with us platitude, which so undermined the position of the Christian Church in Europe in the early part of the last century. But that is not what is being said here. The priests remind the people that the Lord their God, that is to say the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, is not bound by human logic, in warfare or in any other thing. This is a call to the Israelite army to put its faith in God and to maintain the covenant which God made with his people. Fundamentally, Israel is to put its trust not in its own fighting power, but in the Lord God, who is able to give victory to his people whether or not they seem to have the military advantage. The combined message of the priests and the army officers is that Israel must remain loyal to its covenant with God, which means maintaining its care for the individual, its sense of justice, and its refusal to adopt the easy way out. For God's covenant puts the care of the young and the poor and those setting out on life's path, as well as the elderly and the frail, above the need to have an army. The stark message to God's people is that even if it means losing the battle, God's people must not behave in ways which undermine God's covenant. For the true meaning of this covenant is that just as God transformed the life of his people when he intervened to rescue them from slavery in Egypt, so too God is always ready to intervene and transform the life of his people as a whole, turning human assumptions upside down. The story of Valentinus we heard earlier certainly bears witness to the sense of the passage from the book of Deuteronomy. But are we able to link Valentinus and the transfiguration of Jesus? as we read two passages from the Bible and consider their meaning? Does Paul in his second letter to the Christians in Corinth help us as he writes about God shining in our hearts, bringing us knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ? The answer is yes, but we need to know something about the situation in Corinth in order to know how. Corinth was an important trading city, a very multicultural, multi-religious city. It was also a violent city, one where everybody seemed to be out for themselves, nobody seeming to care what happened to others as long as it didn't affect them directly. In those circumstances, says Paul, Christians are called to behave differently by renouncing disgraceful, underhand ways, by refusing to use cunning arguments or sleight of hand, by refusing to distort the word of God to suit the needs of the moment. For what we proclaim, says Paul, is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, who is the image of God. In other words, human assumptions are to be transformed by the call of God to be his people. This complete reversal of normality is therefore similar to the call of God in the book of Deuteronomy. 
and it is also the reversal of human expectations which might follow on from the transfiguration of Jesus. The story of the transfiguration comes in the central section of Mark's Gospel, where Jesus concludes his ministry in Galilee and sets his face to go to Jerusalem. So this is an important moment in the Gospel story. The Transfiguration is a reminder to us that Jesus Christ is far more than a great prophet. He is far more than a great teacher. He is far more than a performer of miracles. He is even far more than Moses, the great lawgiver. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the incarnate Word of God, the very image of God. And the voice from the cloud on the mountain top is heard by the disciples as Jesus' divine glory is revealed. This is my Son, my beloved. Listen to him. The Jesus whom the disciples had followed along the byways of Galilee, whom they had heard teaching and healing in the synagogues and on the hillsides, is revealed to them now for an instant as the Son of God in glory. The kingdom of God is surely about to be revealed, and all will be sweetness and light from here on in. That must have been what the disciples were thinking. But on the way down the mountain, Jesus speaks to his disciples about his coming suffering and death of his being treated with contempt by the authorities. The road which Jesus Christ must travel in order to fulfill the loving will of his Father is not going to be a triumphant progress of glory and praise, but a journey made in the growing darkness of the shadow of the cross. Yes, there will be the resurrection, but victory will not be won on a mountain top with the glory of the eternal Son of God shining out and almost blinding the awestruck disciples. Instead, it will be won on a very different mound of earth, in conditions which have nothing to do with human glory and everything to do with what humans judge to be utter disgrace and total failure. Victory will be won when Jesus dies on the cross in total obedience to the will of his Father, the complete reversal of human expectations. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ, but it is the face of the crucified one which shows us this glory. Whilst both God's glory shining on the mountaintop and the horror of the cross are real. Jesus cannot have the one without the other, and neither can we. There is a sense in which both the transfiguration of Jesus and the story of St. Valentine tell us that true love is costly. They tell us that living in accordance with the will of God, living as his covenant people, means trusting in his power to transform us and the world. Trusting in his love which challenges worldly assumptions. Trusting in the Jesus Christ who goes to the cross for our salvation and who only after that is risen from the dead. Psalm 50, with which we opened this act of worship, speaks of God's judgment of his people. Perhaps God will judge whether we, his people, have taken seriously enough his ability to transform our lives, indeed transfigure our lives, so that like the saints and martyrs of old, we too may make known the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
and perhaps God's judgment will include the question as to whether we have understood that whilst his love transforms and transfigures our lives, true glory is not based solely on any mountaintop experience, but on the willingness to take the road of the cross. May God grant us his spirit, so that we too may be faithful witnesses and faithful disciples, no matter what the cost and to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the glory, now and for ever. Amen. Our prayers of intercession will be based on the first letter of Paul to the Christians in Corinth, in chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. But firstly, prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, today as we remember how on the mountain top you glorified your Son and commanded us to listen to him, we give you thanks that through his cross and resurrection our lives also have been transfigured by the glory of your presence, made known to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And as we also remember your servant Valentinus, we give thanks for his Christian faith, which led him to challenge unjust laws and to die as a witness to the gospel. We ask, through the power of your Spirit, that we also might be given courage to speak and to act for the truth of the gospel, and, if necessary, to suffer for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we give you thanks for your Son Jesus Christ, and all that he means for us. We remember words of the Apostle Paul and offer our prayers of intercession. The word of the cross is folly. We pray that we and all the church may not be ashamed of the cross, nor afraid of those who scorn the gospel message, that the cross was your way of meeting our need. God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. We pray for all who seek true wisdom, for all who are regarded as leaders in the world's search for truth, for all whose wisdom is acclaimed by the world that they may see in Jesus Christ true wisdom and seek to know him above all things. God has chosen what the world counts as foolishness to shame the wise. We pray for those whom the world dismisses as being of no account. For those who dream dreams of God's kingdom. For those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. For those who show mercy. And for those who walk humbly before God. May the world come to see in their foolishness the vision of true faith. God has chosen the weak to shame the strong. We pray for the powerful of this world, that they may offer their strength to you, O God, and use it in your service. We pray for the weak of the world, that the strong may respond to their needs with compassion and humility. 
God has chosen the low and despised to bring to nothing that which boasted of its own greatness and importance. We pray for those in the world who are despised, for those who are regarded as of no importance by those who see themselves as rulers of the world. May they receive justice May they know themselves to be important in your eyes, O God. And may those who dismiss them as unimportant be brought to see that their own self-importance is of no account before the God who judges all. And we pray too for those whom we know to be in particular need this day asking that they may receive healing and wholeness through the power of your creating and recreating spirit. So let him who boasts boast of the Lord. May the Lord Jesus Christ, his cross and resurrection, be our only glory. For we ask it in his name and for his sake. And as he taught us, so we pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. We sing the hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded.
worship will be led by Reverend Anne White. So let us now prepare for the week ahead as we receive God's blessing. Now may the God of love fill you with his spirit so that you may walk in love for God and for one another that Christ Jesus may be glorified in you. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you and with all God's people this day and for evermore. Amen. Thank you.